All right, what's going on with some judges? The media watches the politicians, and you see them every night on cable news. But what about the judges? With their courtrooms closed to cameras and people fearful to defend any judge who might be ruling on one's case, and of course, the lifetime appointment of federal judges means some judges are getting a free pass. They're escaping any scrutiny. And some judges are just plain unfair. Yes, of course, some decisions are tough to make and people can disagree, but some decisions about what's right and fair, they're obvious. And when a judge goes rogue or doesn't care or is steeped in bias, people get unfairly hurt. Let me give you some examples of bad judging that hurts people. I will begin with Federal District Court Judge Tanya Chutkin. She's the judge overseeing the January 6th trial, and she just set a trial date of March 4th for the January 6th trial here in Washington. There's no urgency. The indictment isn't even a year old. And the only one who has speedy trial rights under the Constitution is a defendant, not the prosecutor, not the special counsel. And former President Trump has not asked for a speedy trial, because that'd be nuts, because there is no way his lawyer or any lawyer can be ready by March 4th. Why not? Because the government is dumping 12.8 million documents on the defense lawyer to read before the trial and to study and know. That means the defense lawyer, to do his constitutional duty of effective assistance of counsel, would have to read more than 66,000 pages each day, including weekends and holidays before March 4th. No one can read 66,000 pages a day. You know that's ridiculous, and chances are you're on a lawyer, because you have a real education, common sense, and a sense of fair play. The judge doesn't care. She should, but she doesn't care about the Constitution, about the Sixth Amendment right to effective assistance of counsel, and she's not worried about her job. Like all federal judges, she has a lifetime appointment. No one will touch her. In fact, everyone who sees her in the court of the grocery store calls her Your Honor. But she's not alone in not caring about constitutional rights of citizens who appear before her. Here's another example. The 34-year-old judge, Scott McAfee, in Fulton County. He's assigned to the Fulton County indictment brought by DA Fawny Willis. This is the biggest case of his career. The whole world is watching. He knows that there are 19 co-defendants, each with constitutional rights, including the Eighth Amendment right to bail. So what does he do? Goes on vacation. So as to deprive one co-defendant, Harrison Ford, from having a bond hearing where he could get a bond number placed on his head that he could then post and get out of jail pending trial like the other 18 co-defendants. So because McAfee went on vacation, Harrison Floyd didn't get a bond on Thursday, and he sat in that Fulton County jail with lice, bed bugs, shanks, and more from Thursday night until yesterday, Tuesday, when the judge returned from vacation. And do not tell me McAfee didn't know about Floyd. Of course he did. The entire world did. But even if McAfee, in the biggest case of his career and with the nation watching, didn't want to give up a vacation day, he had options. Floyd was remote from the jail for the Friday hearing with a substitute judge, so don't tell me that Judge McAfee could not have a likewise been remote from the beach or wherever and likewise called into that hearing and given Floyd a bond on Friday so he could go home. But the judge didn't care. And again, to repeat, the judge had options. Another option, he could have told that substitute judge to put a bond on Floyd so Floyd could get out. Instead, that substitute judge concluded that Floyd, who walked into the jail to surrender, was dangerous because he has a charge from getting into a heated argument at Maryland in February with two FBI agents serving a grand jury subpoena. By the way, and this is extremely important, that Maryland charge, it's a misdemeanor. Floyd is presumed innocent. Now brace yourself for this. The judge in the Maryland case, who has much more information than the Friday afternoon substitute judge in Georgia, released Floyd because that judge, who was close to the case, didn't think Floyd is dangerous. And Floyd even told that substitute judge this, but she ignored him. She held him without bond in that Fulton County Jail with all those constitutional violations until the vacationing judge, McAfee, got around to coming home and doing his job. Neither McAfee nor that substitute judge cares about constitutional rights or even old-fashioned decency. But why should either care? People still bow in front of them, calling them Your Honor, even though both disgracefully ignored Harrison Floyd's a citizen, presumed innocent, who walked into that jail voluntarily to be booked. Floyd doesn't mean anything to them, and neither does the Constitution. By the way, Judge McAfee does not have a lifetime appointment like a federal judge. He was, however, appointed in February by Governor Brian Kemp, who is D.A. Willis Chief's witness against former President Trump. But alas, it's not just Georgia and Washington, D.C., where we see judges behaving poorly. Check out my home state, Wisconsin. 
And this is the state's highest court, the Wisconsin Supreme Court. In short, it's nuts. Don't believe me? Well, first, some recent history. Back in 2011, one Supreme Court justice, Justice Ann Walsh Bradley, claimed a fellow Supreme Court justice, David Prosser, tried to strangle her. Yeah, strangle her. The choking incident allegedly occurred, Prosser denies it, when they disagreed about the collective bargaining rights of public employees. No matter who's right, this is 100% nuts. And this went on in the highest court of Wisconsin. And even after this, these two justices continue to sit on the court and make important decisions for the residents of Wisconsin. I know what you're thinking. That was 2011. Things must have changed. Nope. Still nuts. Still dysfunctional. Here's the latest this month, August 2023. Chief Justice Annette Ziegler sent two scathing emails accusing the liberal majority of the high court of staging a coup against her. Her word, coup. A coup, really? She said the liberal majority was conducting an illegal experiment when they voted to weaken her powers and fire the director of state courts and appoint an interim one, Audrey Swarowacki. That's not all. The chief justice is also annoyed that the interim director of state courts is signing her name without her knowledge or her approval. Who does that? And then the chief justice's emails to the liberal justices were leaked to the Associated Press. One email reads in part, you are making a mess of the judiciary, the court and the institution for years to come. She goes on to write, this must stop. I have no confidence in the recent hostile takeover and the chaotic effect it has had on the court staff and the overall state functioning of the courts. This is the highest court. Well, that email didn't sit well with one of the liberal justices, Rebecca Dallet. She responded likewise in an email to the chief judge saying she was disappointed that the chief justice was communicating through the media. That criticism, communicating through the media, is sort of interesting since somehow Dallas' email likewise ended up in the media. Justice Dallas also wrote this about the Chief Justice's email, saying that it's, quote, deeply inappropriate and at times partisan tone and tenor. Dallas also added this in her email to the Chief Justice. Let me be crystal clear. The attempt to obstruct the proper business of the court and the furtherance of justice comes from you, meaning the Chief Justice. This is all crazy, isn't it? These are justices. And by the way, if you are thinking right now, so glad I don't live in Wisconsin where the highest court is so dysfunctional, so nutty, well, I have some really bad news for you. Wisconsin is a swing state, likely to determine who wins the White House in 2024. And guess, guess who will decide all the election and voting issues that may arise? This dysfunctional court. Yes, this dysfunctional court could be picking your next president. Yikes, right? Former U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Alabama, Jay Town, joins me. Jay, so what do you think about judges? Am I wrong? <laughs> yikes. <laughs> no, you're yikes, not wrong. Yeah, uh, yeah yikes is, is it. Uh, you know, you, the, you make a great point, and it's an important one, Greta, that when we have these very concerning in-depth issues, um, you know, it's one thing if they're just approving a, you know, or disapproving a search warrant that happened five years ago and the guy's done 90% of his time already. It's another thing when they are making these decisions that, that are going to impact, uh, you know, the democratic lean of a, of a state or, or an electorate uh, or, uh, you know, who has certain privileges uh, like the attorney-client privilege that is, we've seen be eviscerated over the last year and a half or so. Um, and, and we have to really take care. It's one thing to appoint a good lawyer um, or a smart guy or gal. It's another thing to appoint someone who's going to be a good judge. And the best judges I've ever served in front of, they were consistent and they worked hard. That is what makes a good judge. It isn't that they're conservative or liberal. You know, if you had dinner with a liberal Supreme Court justice, it would be just as much fun as if you had dinner with a conservative one. And, and that's really what we should be striving for with our, our folks that we put on the yeah. bench. Yeah, but you know, this is this is the irony. I mean, this is, and I could say this, you can't, is that in Wisconsin Supreme Court, it's a girl fight. I mean, it's like what you'd see in some halls of some school, but, you know, the girls clawing each other's eyes out. And they're, they're supposed to be Supreme Court justices. They make so many decisions, not just the election, but every other every other case goes up to the Supreme Court, and they, lo they look nuts. Well, in, in, the, in your broader point, and they do look nuts, and I have a 12-year-old, so I know about the girl fight stuff. 
Uh, it is, it is, it, what it does is it deteriorates the trust and confidence that folks have in those very important decisions. Decisions that rise to the Supreme Court of a state or the United States, those are incredibly important, rare decisions that are going to impact the state, not just on that one case, but forever as precedent. And, and so they, they really have to be aware of themselves as much as they are the law. I can, I cannot get over that McAfee let that guy sit oh. in the jail. From, I mean, I, I mean, even the, the Maryland judge where that's simplest, where that misdemeanor is. And by the way, you know, that's, he's presumed innocent and all that. It looks like he just got into a fight with two FBI agents trying to serve it. But they, Maryland lets him out and didn't think he's dangerous. But they've got this substitute. I don't know. I mean, it was like a substitute teacher almost who did the unthinkable thing. And she says, he's dangerous. And that judge doesn't bother to call and take care of us, lets him sit in that terrible jail all weekend long. That's just mean. That's just mean. There are there are people accused of murder in Fulton County that have a bond. It is absurd to say that a federal court who gave um, Floyd a bond, um, that that wasn't a good enough assessment for the substitute judge. And for McAfee, remember, the two greatest things a judge can be is consistent and work hard. And McAfee is failing on both here. Um, he, he goes on vacation. He, you know, if the Greta, if they only he's had only been on the bench handheld... since February. He waits. Well, he's only yeah. been on the bench since February, and he's got a vacation. I mean, he, he acts like he's French, and he's going to take off the month of August. I mean, it's just crazy. Right. <laughs> well, if only they invented a, a handheld device where you could pick it up, you could dial a series of numbers, and get somebody else on the other end who also has a handheld device, and they communicate and say, "Give him a bond. What's the normal bond for this? Ten thousand well, dollars. Okay, done. It would have been easy." Well, let me just. Yeah, and let me just say one last point is that you can get a telephone warrant from a judge and call up and get a judge to issue a warrant in many jurisdictions. You can't get this. Anyway, J-Town, thank you.